Up next is the first of a series of talks I had with Dr. Patrick O'Gara, Professor of Medicine at Harvard and Director of Clinical Cardiology at the Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Pat is also the newly elected Vice President of the American College of Cardiology, which means he'll be the President in three years. Our first talk is on asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis and left ventricular hypertrophy. Is it time to operate? So, Pat, let's talk about how to approach the patient when we see a patient like this and have to tell them, usually it's an older patient, have to tell them maybe ought to consider surgery or some other intervention. Well, thanks very much, Fred. I think that currently the management of the older patient with severe but asymptomatic aortic stenosis is a real challenge. And it's not appropriate to say that one size fits all. I think that we should start in an office setting, of course, with trying to verify as best we can that the patient is truly asymptomatic. And that does require a, a detailed history. If ambiguity remains after the history is obtained, then an exercise test can be very helpful in these patients. I think many studies would verify the generally held notion that exercise testing under supervised circumstances in these patients is safe and can be performed, especially, of course, if left ventricular systolic function is normal and that a physician is in attendance rather than to have a test like this performed by our ancillary staff. It would not be appropriate, I think, to have the patient or the staff vulnerable under these circumstances. We worry about it, but it generally seems to be quite safe. And that kind of information may tip the balance, either for or against, earlier intervention. And I think it's also appropriate to realize, or at least to admit, that it's possible to have conversations about operation in truly asymptomatic individuals because cardiac surgery has become so good and the outcomes have become predictably excellent for large proportions of patients, even elderly patients, but particularly elderly patients without coronary artery disease, for example. And many centers are now reporting perioperative mortality rates in that group of patients at 1% or less, which would have been unthinkable 10 or 15 years ago. It's very important, I think, to understand that, but it's also important to make sure that the surgical center to which you're referring your patients can achieve that kind of a standard. Because if you look into the SDS database, it will still say that nationwide perioperative mortality rates for aortic valve replacement surgery are in the range of 3 to 4 percent. Okay, so we should expect someplace around 1 percent in a good center for an asymptomatic, relatively so. healthy, 80-some-year-old patient uh, and get them through that. So. Talking in those terms, and I always like to talk to the patient in the 99% right. side of that dimension rather than the 1% side of it, but that sounds like pretty good odds for getting a patient through surgery and back to function in this group of patients who are showing up in their 80s, still active, still busy, yes. and the question is where are they going with it. So right. what I, are the predictors? I mean, a patient asked me the other day, how long am I going to live, doc? And, right. I, you know, and I said, well, if you're 83 and you're healthy, you probably have a five-year life expectancy. Is it worth doing the valve under those circumstances? How do you make the decision? Well, I think that's a really very, very good question. And it speaks to whether each patient has a golden moment in time at which an intervention like this should be performed. On the one hand, one never wishes to do surgery too prematurely because obviously even if patients survive surgery, particularly in this age group, they may have a morbid complication of the surgery. And for them, that could be worse than actually dying with the surgery, namely having a stroke. So we do have to be careful that a surgery, although it has become relatively safe and the outcomes are excellent, there are still patients who suffer morbid complications that should give us pause. On the other hand, you don't want to wait too long. So for your patient who's now 82 and highly functional, possibly working part-time, doing a lot of volunteer activities, that's somebody who it would seem could have an intervention and enjoy several more years of productivity and a functional outcome from the surgery that you would really like to see. If you waited until your patient were 86 or 87, possibly sicker, development of diabetes or some other chronic condition, then the prospects of surgery seem much less attractive. And I actually think that we should individualize these decisions and recognize that there could be a golden moment in time at which to pull the trigger, so to speak. 
So we have numbers. We have a valve area. We have right. peak velocity through the valve. We have some numbers that seem to help in making decisions. Where do you go with those? And let me ask you also, in valve area, about the size of the patient. A lot of these folks are small. Yeah. I told a patient the other day that, you know, a 110-pound woman, that her valve area would be much worse in a 200-pound man, you know. So how do you deal with those numbers when we get them? I'm glad you mentioned that. We do need to verify that the aortic stenosis is severe. And in a person who has a normal cardiac output, that generally equates with having a jet velocity that exceeds 4 meters per second and a valve area that's 1 centimeter squared or less, with a mean gradient usually in the range of 40 millimeters mercury. But it's important to recognize that a critical aortic stenosis in one patient may not be critical in the next, and what you provide as an example is perfect. If a one centimeter squared valve is in a six foot six inch professional athlete, that's very different than your 110 pound woman. It is important to normalize the valve area for the body surface area in order to obtain a better physiologic appreciation as to how significant the stenosis might be. I think other things to recognize when doing echocardiography would be the extent of hypertrophy. Severe degrees of hypertrophy it could be a marker for excess risk at the time of surgery and long term. And depending upon how long the aortic stenosis has been present, left ventricular mass may or may not decrease following successful replacement of the valve. The superimposition of coronary disease is always worrisome. At least 50% of older patients will have significant coronary disease that complicates their aortic stenosis. Hypertension is a very common comorbidity. Always raises questions about the safety of medications when you're trying to walk a very fine line between blood pressure control and hypotension that would exacerbate the obstruction with valve stenosis. Let's talk about the big hot topic these days, TAVR. Here comes a patient, the same situation. Now, the valve's been approved for treatment in certain populations right. of older individuals. Europe is drifting toward a more ubiquitous use of TAVR for aortic stenosis. Where do you go with that when people ask about it? They all come in with the headlines or the web page that talks about non-surgical aortic valve replacement. Well, I think it's very exciting, but we are certainly not there yet. And whether or not TAVR achieves the kind of safety and effectiveness we would like it to, to consider its use in asymptomatic patients remains to be seen. I'm excited that in the second iteration of the PARTNER trial, there will be a focus on lower risk patients by STS score. And it will be, I think, incumbent upon us to show safety, efficacy, and durability of TAVR in less sick patients before we even begin to think of extending it to patients who are not sick at all. So I think that Dr. Leon and his colleagues who have helped forward this type of technology have been considerate. I think that the ACC and STS valve registry will teach us a lot about what may happen longer term in larger numbers of patients. And as you pointed out, it is commercially available, but for a very highly select group of older patients who are not considered candidates for surgery. It's a very exciting future, I think. Right. Well, and the other thing, of course, is it's not a simple procedure where you just purchase a couple catheters and stents and go to work. I mean, this requires a very, very carefully constructed team, certain skills in all the team members, including the cardiologist and the surgeon and the nursing support team and everything to make sure this goes right. Careful evaluation of the vascular system. It's not a simple procedure at this point. So I think with the surgical mortality and relatively healthy elderly individuals that's bordering on 1%, it seems to me that that's still going to be the first recommendation we make at this point in time. Yes, I agree. Good. Well, Pat, thanks again for talking about aortic stenosis. Again, very important topic, very common problem in clinical practice. New things coming down the road that may change the way we do things in the future. But as of today, I think what I'm hearing you say is we still ought to be talking the surgical option when it's time to have the surgery. Yes. Good. Thanks.